Welcome to the Pittsburgh Gal Principal Podcast, where women school leaders and teachers come to share their school and classroom stories about teaching, learning, and leading. If you are a woman leader or teacher, I would love to have you on the show and share your story. Please connect with me on Twitter at eclaire underscore ahs or following my blog at pittsburghgalprincipal.wordpress.com. This is episode one of Pittsburgh Gal Principal. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I'm really excited to introduce you to Tisha Richmond. Tisha is a culinary arts teacher and career and technical education chair out in a high school at South Medford High School in Oregon. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Tisha. Hi. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I am new to Skype, and so I realized I had it downloaded on my other laptop and I didn't have it downloaded on the one that I was trying to connect with. So no big deal. No big deal. <laughs> well, hi, how are you tonight? I am great. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your Sunday to talk to me. I know how busy it can be. Oh, I'm very happy to do so. I'm honored. So, um, uh, first I just, you know, wanted to take a minute and have you kind of tell me a little bit about your school, South Medford High School, all the way in Oregon. I'm all the way in Pittsburgh, so we're like on way other sides of the country here, which is kind of cool. Yes, it is. I love it. So, yes, South Medford High School is in Southern Oregon. So we have a, a population of about 2,000 students. And um, it's an amazing school. We have a fairly large district, and I've been teaching there for 10 years. Okay, wow. Um, that's very different than the setup I'm at. Uh, we have about 500 students, um, wow. you know, nowhere close to your 2,000. Um, I, I noticed on your website it talks about uh, that South Medford has four personal learning communities. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, our school is divided into learning communities. Um, so when students come in as a freshman, they are in Freshman Academy, and Freshman Academy is, is divided into different houses. And then when they leave their freshman year, they get to select a small school that they want to be associated with and they would like to be a part of. So we have Champs, which is um, kind of the school that is more geared around um, the medical field. We have Discovery, which is a little bit more focused on service learning and business. And then we have Bach, which is our um, art school. So it's a little bit more focused on the theater, music, and uh, 3D and two-dimensional art. Okay, awesome. So, it's a, so it is. It's a really great um, setup because students really get individual, individualized learning. Um, teachers um, meet in a core group where they to um, talk about, you know, students and, and try to develop the best plan for them. And it, it just creates a really um, a great personalized learning environment for our kids. Okay, so they, they choose them after their freshman year. Do, do any kids have, like, a lot of angst that goes around choosing which house they're going to go into? Or do you find um, that students will choose kind of where their friends go? No, or how do you I think, um, you know, you know, it, it's not a, sometimes kids will get their second pick. It's not always the first pick because you have to kind of keep it equal among students. But I don't find that they, they do. I think that there, there's a lot of talk and um, preparation with students before they make that decision. And so they have a chance to um, listen to each of the different small schools, kind of share about their school. And, and the nice thing, too, is that our small schools are not completely isolated. So, for instance, as a culinary arts teacher, um, I have all kids. And so if I have kids that are on Discovery, Champs, and Bach. So, so just really the small schools, um, there's, a, there's a core makeup of teachers for the core subjects. But as far as elective choices, students can go out of that small school to to different elective teachers. Okay. All right. Well, that makes sense. Um, now the way that we got connected was obviously over Twitter and mm -hmm. I love Twitter. I, I totally see the power of it. Can you talk a little bit about how, um, your journey has been on Twitter and how it's kind of affected your teaching in the classroom? 
Absolutely. So I kind of entered into the ed tech world about two years ago. Uh, we uh, get Perkins funded as a, a culinary program. We are a program of study. And so as um, a regional program of study, all the culinary teachers in Southern Oregon thought, you know what, it'd be really great if we could get a classroom set of iPads for our classrooms. And so we requested that through our Perkins funding and received it. And along with that request, we all knew that we must have professional development. We wanted to make sure that if we were going to be integrating these iPads into our classes, we wanted to make sure that we were trained in how to use them effectively. And so that first year, it was uh, the summer of 2014, I signed up for uh, professional development at iPad Palooza in Austin, Texas. And it was really that conference that opened my eyes to the world of educational technology. And at that conference, I just noticed all these people were, were typing on, you know, sending message, <laughs> messages to each other on Twitter and they were communicating and you could win prizes when you tweeted. And, and it was a totally new world for me because up to that point, I knew of Twitter, but I never thought about being able to use it in my professional life. I just, you know, would hear people tweeting about what they ate for breakfast and it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me up to that point. And so when I got back, from that conference, I got connected on Twitter and just started to connect with different educators. And that just kind of started the, the journey. The fo that following November, I went to another conference called Miami Device. And at, at that conference, I was really able to connect with some amazing educators that just kind of started my professional learning network. And so from that professional learning network, I just, it's just amazing how many connections that you can make and the conversations that you can have about education and, and the ed ideas that you can get from other educators. And so I, it's been an amazing journey and it's been extremely inspiring. And I have just grown my professional learning network so much through being on Twitter and being able to connect with various educators through through chats and just just getting to know them yeah. and develop that relationship. Absolutely. Have you been able to uh, convert any Twitter naysayers at your school or any of your friends who are kind of still like, I don't know about this Twitter thing? I have. In fact, just a month ago, I did a little breakout professional development session at, at my school on Twitter. And I shared just how amazing it can be when you use it for education. And I just think that there's so many educators that just don't realize the value of it and what it can be used for. And so I, I do. Any opportunity that I get, I am talking to fellow educators at my school about getting on Twitter and and we have you know through the course of this last year especially more and more teachers at my school are using it and they're starting to understand the value okay very cool well I know that you definitely had an impact at, at my own school where I'm a principal um, you know your uh, food trucks war PBL happened um, at Avonworth which was really neat to um, see and to share um, so I was so happy when I ran into that tweet that you tweeted, um, you know, something you were doing in your own classroom, and I shared it with her own family consumer science teacher. So you had a positive impact all the way in Pittsburgh. That's awesome. Yes, very awesome. Um, now, I noticed that you do a lot of um, tweeting uh, with the hashtag TLAP and XPLAP. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that um, for someone who might not know what that's all about? Yes. So my first year at Miami Device, I met Michael Matera, and he is a gamification guru, and he wrote the book Explore Like a Pirate. And through that connection, um, I actually met him in a lunch line as I was eating lunch at, on one of the days of the conference, and he started talking about gamification. And up to that point, I really didn't understand it, and I didn't know what it was about. All I knew was, you know, I thought it was about playing games in the classroom. And so we started talking and I started sharing about some of the, the competitions that I have in my class and how I love to use games in various ways. And um, he just really inspired me to expand that even further. 
And so I continued to talk with him through that year. I saw him again at Miami Device the following year when I went. And at that point, he was about ready to uh, publish a book through Dave Burgess Publishing, which Dave Burgess wrote Teach Like a Pirate. And he's published a lot of various books about education since then. And so through that book, I so I bought the book right away as soon as it came out. And shortly after, Michael asked me if I would host the Explore Like a Pirate book chat for him. And so I, I gladly uh, chose to do that because I just... Um, I just was so inspired by the book, and when I started using gamification in my classroom, I was just amazed at what an impact it was making. And so it's just it's just grown from there. I've um, over the last year, I've, I've gamified all of my classes, and it's it's been a really really exciting adventure. And so I love to share out what I'm doing in the classroom with gamif- gamification um, at with that hashtag with the XP Lab hashtag. Because everybody who um, reads the book um, follows that hashtag. And so we have book chats every Wednesday at uh, 5 Pacific time. And so we just share about how we're using gamification in the classroom each week. Okay, very cool. I'm going to have to join that um, hashtag Twitter chat here this week. So so tell anyone who's listening who doesn't really understand what gamification means, um, can you like give us some examples of what that would look like? Yes. So the way that I view gamification is it is using the game mechanics that in games that we, we all love. So if you think about the game of Monopoly and all the mechanics that go into the game of Monopoly, Monopoly to make it a fun and exciting game. It's taking those type of mechanics and layering it over your curriculum to really engage and immerse students in the learning process. So you're not necessarily changing your curriculum. You're still teaching to the same targets, the same standards, but you are using game mechanics that make games fun and you're layering it over your course content to create a much more immersive learning environment. Okay. It looks like um, maybe a couple of weeks ago you were doing something in your classroom that looked similar to possibly Survivor. Was I understanding that correctly or no? I have a game right now called The Amazing Race. Yes, yes, that that's what it is. Doing in Culinary 3. So I started the last semester with The Amazing Food Truck Race. And we were launching into American regional cuisine. And so I used the amazing food truck race as kind of my game theme. And students were divided into teams and they chose a food truck name and they chose a concept and they had to create some type of menu items that they were going to serve on this food truck. And so I invited staff members in and, They pitch their concepts to the staff members, and then those staff members were given a certain amount of money, play money, that they could divide up among the food trucks that they felt gave the best pitches. And then as we progressed through the game, and we went from region to region of the U.S. learning about the different flavor profiles and the different cultural influences within each region, students would take that concept that they created with their food truck and they would adapt it to that particular region. And then each unit at the end of, you know, the, the specific region that we were studying, I would invite investors or customers in again, and then students would share their concept with those judges and then judges would be able to vote on their favorite. And so that was such a success and I enjoyed it so much. And my students enjoyed it so much that when we finished American regional cuisine, I wanted to think of a a different theme that I could use to introduce international cuisine, which was the next, the next unit that I was jumping into. And so I chose the amazing race theme for that particular game. And so I've just kind of based the theme on the show, the amazing race and the game elements that are within that show I use as kind of my framework for, um, for the, for the classroom game. Very cool. Um, now, I think some some teachers might be a little hesitant to do games in their classroom because they're afraid maybe they feel like they're not creative or they can't come up with the ideas. 
Um, what do you do to kind of get that creative wheel going when you're planning out your units? Well, first of all, I started very small, and when I decided to launch into gamification, I just tried to start with one specific unit, and advice that Michael Matera gave me was try to think of a theme. Use TV, use your favorite board games as inspiration, and think about what are the mechanics in those TV shows and in those games that you love to play that make them exciting to play. You know, you think about Monopoly and you want to play for hours and hours, and it's because of all the mechanics that are involved in that game that keep keeping it, you know, it keeps it exciting. And so I would say that think of games that you enjoy or think of TV games, shows that you enjoy and, and start from there as your inspiration point. And once you pick that inspiration point and you pick that theme, then all the other things start falling into place. And I did not have my game completely figured out when I started. I, I figured out my basic framework. I thought about the theme that I wanted to use, like the Amazing Race or the, or the, um, the Great Food Truck Race. And then as I launched the game and I, as I saw students responding to the game, then I added in different mechanics to keep it exciting and keep, and keep all kids engaged. So, for instance, if I noticed that I had a certain – Certain amount of kids that were really into it, but then some other kids weren't quite buying in yet. I would come up with a game mechanic to draw in those kids so that it was an experience that was really immersive for everybody and not just a certain a certain amount of, of kids in my class. Okay. What do you see as the biggest difference um, f for the students since you've uh, started including gamification in your curriculum? The biggest difference that I've found is that students are, first of all, very excited to learn. And, you know, in culinary arts, typically students take the class because they want to. Um, it is, you know, it is a fairly immersive learning environment. But I've noticed since gamification that students are even more excited than they ever have been before to be in my class and to learn. They go the extra mile. Students are coming in at lunch and office hours and before school to to, to do the extra um, that they wouldn't have done otherwise. It's very collaborative. Students are uh, really working together to solve problems, to you know, to problem solve and just to collaborate and learn together. And it's created a, a really close bond within my classes, um, especially in my culinary three class where it's a year long class. Um, students are close because they are, they're learning together in, um, and problem solving, and it's, it's rigorous. I mean, they are really um, working at a higher level than they've ever worked at before. And so that, those are all the elements that I just love. You know, students are, are immersed, they're collaborating, they're problem solving, and learning's coming alive for them, which is my passion. I want to do everything I can to make learning come alive for my students. Now, it looks like you also had um, some positive news to share from this weekend. Were, were, was that from students in your Culinary 3 as well? Yes, it was. I had four students. Um, they were teamed up in teams of two and are, I wouldn't say local because they're about three hours away, but it's the closest culinary school to us in Southern Oregon. And so that is the school that I'm, that our program is articulated with. So students in my program get college credit. So that particular college was hosting a culinary competition. And so students in the first round were to create a menu and submit it. And the menu could be based on any theme that they wanted, but there were certain elements that had to be included. So I had students in my class that submitted their menus for this contest and uh, two teams were accepted to move on to round two. And so this last weekend in Eugene, Oregon, uh, we, we went up there. I took the four kids and they competed in round two and there were many different elements to round two. There was a segment of the competition where they had to, um, to solve some uh, financial percentages. They had to convert recipes. There was a segment where they had to identify different products. There were 25 products that they had to identify. 
And then there was a black box competition. And so students were given a certain amount of ingredients and they had to use every single one of them. They had access to the pantry and the refrigerator and they had to come up with on the spot a meal. So they had to include an appetizer, an entree and dessert. And they had to prepare that meal within a two hour segment of time and then present it to the judges. And it was amazing. I was just really, really proud of my students. Um, all four of them did exceptionally well, but the two of them came home with the first place award, which was incredible because it was a, a $5,000 scholarship for each of them for that particular culinary school. And all four of them, because they passed round one, came home with a, a brand new Mercer knife kit that was valued at $270. So very, very exciting weekend for our students. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Them. Talk about making the learning relevant for them. There you go. There's a great example. Awesome. And that's what I loved about it is that they're taking, you know, the skills that they're learning in the class and, you know, it's the, that ultimate summit of assessment where they have to show what they know. And so they're having to apply all those cooking methods and all of those, those skills that we've been practicing in class. And they have to, they have to apply it in a, in a high pressure situation. And, and the thing that I loved most about it was the sense of accomplishment they felt when they were done. You know, I, I love that, you know, a couple of my, there's, they were sitting around the table and one of my students said, I don't even, it doesn't even matter to me if we place, like, I'm just so proud of us. And that to me, it was just like, that's what it's all about. You know, they, they work together. I mean, that's the ultimate problem solving and collaboration is, is having to come together and figure out what to do with this basket of ingredients within a certain amount of time. And they did it. You know, they accomplished it by producing this amazing meal. So it was, it was exciting. And I was a, it was a, definitely a, a proud teacher moment to get to be there and experience it. Absolutely. Well, they were um, obviously prepared very well. Um, so nice job, Tisha. Uh, you know, like a, a lot of schools don't offer culinary arts anymore. I'm excited to know that yours does as mine does as well. What, what all, all are the courses that you teach? So we teach, um, I have another partner teacher and we're both full time. So my partner teacher teaches um, culinary one. It's a semester class. In that class, you learn the fundamentals. You know, you're learning how to read a recipe, how to do basic measurements. Um, and then you're learning some of the basics of baking. So he does um, quick breads, learning different cooking methods with fruit and vegetables, with grains. There's an uh, element of understanding nutritional content within that course. And then you're, you know, learning safety and sanitation. So students are getting their food handlers card through the course as well. And then moving on to, and the knife, knife skills, and then moving on to culinary two, we're building on those skills. So I break it into two quarters. So we do baking and pastry where they're learning yeast spreads, pies and pastries and cakes. And then the second quarter, they're learning um, the, the culinary side of things. So we're learning some different knife skills, kind of taking it to the next level. And then they're learning sauces, cooking methods with meat and poultry, how to put together a meal and the different elements of a meal. And then culinary three is a year long class and we learn advanced baking techniques. And we also learn regional American and international cuisine. And then four, is the next level it also is a year long but it's combined with my culinary three class and so within that class um, students are working very independently and so when we when catering events arise and and there's different things either within our school or outside of our school that we take on those students are are um, responsible for organizing those events and catering for those events so they're it's a, it, they're in, they're independently working within my culinary three class. Okay. I gotcha. Um, so you've told us a lot about your, your classes. Is there anything else kind of really cool or neat that you'd like to share about what's going on at South Medford high school? Yes, absolutely. So I am the current technical education department chair at South and we are really um, beginning to launch some exciting career pathways at our school and we're expanding our career and technical education department this past year, we started a robotics program 
that has really taken off and they, the kids are doing amazing things and they are actually just qualified for nationals um, in skills USA. So they're going to be heading to nationals in at the end of June. So we're really proud of, of that program and, and what the students are accomplishing through that program. We're going to be starting, um, we actually did start this past year and are going to be expanding our manufacturing program. So in that pro program, students are learning how to weld. And there are also um, 3D printers that we that students have access to. So within that manufacturing program, we also have a fab lab where students are learning how to um, create with um, some some awesome tech tools and, and 3D printers. We um, so those two programs we're really really excited about because we have just launched those this past year and they are growing and we, there's some amazing things on the horizon for them. We also uh, offer autos um, in our career and technical education department and we offer business and marketing. So we have a. We have an awesome group of teachers here at South and an amazing career and technical education department. And we just, I, I am very proud of South Medford and, and the school itself. There's just very passionate educators who are just excited about, um, about teaching and, and, and learning. So it's a great school to be a part of. I've been here for 10 years and um, I couldn't think of a better place to be. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of really cool things going on. Um, is the stuff that you have going on with your CTE, do you see it making an impact on uh, the regular core content classes like math, English? Absolutely. I think, you know, we talk about STEAM and, and all the different elements. Um, th those are, it's a huge part of all of our, our CTE classes. And so students are, in all of our classes, students are, integrating the science and the math and the technology and and it's it's just a really important aspect and I think those classes sometimes those hands-on classes students it's what keeps students in school so sometimes students don't necessarily um, excel in some of the core subject areas but they do in the current technical classes and so they're taking those those core subjects and they're being able they're able to apply it in a different way and I think that is something that really is important and it really does make learning come alive for a lot of kids and so I think it's 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 essential I think it's very important to have those programs within schools because kids need to be able to apply um, ap apply content in a hands-on learning environment what do you, uh, Tish, can you tell us a little bit about what you know about digital badging and if you're doing anything at South Medford High School related to that? Yeah, I, you know, I I give badges out to my kids, but I do it, um, I, I, I hand them out tangibly. So I actually have physical badges that I give students and then I record them on a leaderboard. So that is how I'm using them in the classroom on a larger scale. I don't know that there are any other um, programs within our school that are using digital badging. Okay. Is there a reason you're, you're deciding to do them tangibly? Yes. I have found that students really like to be given the tangible badge just for some reason it is more exciting to them. And that was something that was recommended by Michael Matera and I've really found it to be true. And so I have badges that are the size of baseball cards and I give students baseball card holders, like one of those baseball card holder sleeves with the three, you know, the, the binder punches and that's where students keep their badges. And so it's easy for me because throughout the class period, I can hand out badges to students um, for different various reasons and they can just put it right into that sleeve and then uh, there's a day that um, I collect them so on our review day before when we're getting ready for our test um, I collect those badges and and see where they are because those badges um, they hold XP points and they're trying to achieve certain levels by the end of the unit because there's certain incentives for getting to different levels at the end of the unit. Okay can you share a couple of examples of your badges? Yes, so I have really three main ways that I give badges. One is for side quests, which I call bakery missions. And so within each unit, there are some ways that students can go above and beyond what I'm assigning to students, 
you know, within the, that unit as a grade. So side quests are not a part of their grade at all, but if they choose to take on these side quests, which are their missions to demonstrate their learning in a new way. So let's say, for example, in the cake unit, one of my learning targets is to learn various types of icings. And so the side quests for that, for this particular unit, one of the three side quests that I launched was they needed to demonstrate their understanding of icings with either an iMovie video, they could create some type of a, um, a screencast, or they could come up with, I, I usually give them some choice. So they could come up with something totally different, like a comic strip, or they could create um, some type of an app smash. And there are a certain amount of XP that is, is associated with completing that mission. So when students complete that mission, um, I, if they pass that mission and they turn in a quality product that um, I feel is deserving of the XP points, they get a fairly large amount of XP. And so, like, for instance, in the cake unit, when students get to the end of the unit, if they get to 400 XP, then they are, they have, I consider them exempt from the test. So they have shown me in various other ways that they understand the content. And so they have, I feel that they've mastered the content and do not have to take that exam at the end of the unit. And so when they get to master chef and they don't have to take the test, then when everybody else is taking a test, they get to have a free cooking day in my class. So they can, so they can earn it through those side quests. They can earn it through cooking labs. So if, if, a, if a group has exceptional product quality and they have, you know, they create, let's say, a chiffon cake that I would buy because it is is the perfect texture. It the, has the perfect taste. Um, the, they plated it beautifully. Then I might give them a certain amount of XP for that. So it's just a way to, um, I don't know, to award students for going above and beyond and showing um, – just being exemplary, I guess. Okay, cool. Does that happen very often that a student will earn enough XP to not take uh, the traditional exam that you have set out for them? Yeah, I would say in each class, it depends upon the unit, but I'll have about four or five within a class of 30 that will achieve master chef status. And so there are other levels as well. So they, that's the ultimate is to get to master chef status um, and that's 400 XP. But if they get to the level below, which I which I call sous chef, then students get to use a full page of notes on the test. And then if they have 100 XP, then they get to use a three by five card. So there are incentives leading up to Master Chef that are that kids are excited about. So um, it's not you know. So the, everybody feels like they can achieve some type of a level within the unit. Okay. Now, do you have students entering into your class kind of like, whoa, what's all this about XP and launching? Or have you found that what you're doing has kind of gone to other classes as well? I'm, this is my first year of really implementing gamification on a large scale and um, using it in all of my classes. So it's just starting now it's starting to spread in that, you know, I just spoke at a local conference and some of the teachers that were in my session are in my school district. And so now they're wanting me to share within my school. So actually in a couple of weeks I'm offering, the district is offering professional development for the entire district um, for me to speak about gamification. So there's two days within that week that I'm going to be speaking at different, at both of the different high schools in our district on my adventures in gamification. So it's starting to take hold and it's starting to spread um, as, as teachers are seeing what a difference it can make in classes. And that's, you know, it has to do with the students too. When they're excited and they share with other teachers about what's going on, then, then others are curious to see how they could maybe make that type of a, you know, use that framework within their classroom. Okay, very cool. Now doing something like that um, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And as a woman myself, I know that we often get pulled in many, many different directions and it's hard. And, you know, I don't know about your personal life and I'm not asking you to share, but how do you keep that balance 
Um, cause that's something that, you know, all of us women sort of struggle with keeping the balance between home and work. Absolutely. Well, I definitely haven't mastered that. <laughs> I think that I, I struggle with that all the time. Um, I will say as far as gamification goes that it's energized me and that I haven't changed the way that I teach as far as my content has stayed the same. The, the labs that I did last year are the same cooking labs I've done this year. And so I look at it as I've just layered some motivational techniques over what I already did. So I am not recreating the wheel. I'm just adding some elements to make it more engaging. And I've done it little by little. I didn't do it all at once. Um, as far as keeping those boundaries and, you know, I, I try to protect time, certain amount of time over the weekend for my family. Family and and try to save that time out where I don't let anything other anything else interfere. I'm not getting on Twitter. I'm not getting on my computer. But it is a struggle because I am I am passionate about what I do, and I, my, my my wheels are always turning. I'm always trying to think of new ways to make learning exciting. I'm thinking of new game mechanics all the time. I'm watching television shows, and I get ideas. And so it it's it's tough. I think it's very difficult sometimes to to have that balance and and it's just something that I will always continue to work on. <laughs> All right. Well, if you figure it out, let me know. Cause okay. me too. <laughs> so Tisha, what can we expect from you in the next year or so? Well, I, I am definitely going to continue with the gamification. I'm really excited over the summer to, um, plan out my next year and some of the new things that I want to try, some of the new make, me, game mechanics I want to do with gamification. Really excited about heading to USM Spark in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in June. I'm going to speak with uh, Michael Matera and another gamification guru, uh, Nick Davis, at that conference and get to share some of my adventures of gamification. So I'm really looking forward to that conference. There's going to be some amazing edgy rock stars there that I, I'm looking forward to meeting. And um, and I just, I'm really excited about expanding our current technical education department. There's some really exciting things on the horizon um, for our program, you know, at South Medford High School. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing seeing where that takes us. Okay, very cool. Well, I'm looking forward to following you on Twitter and seeing what you have going on. Um, thank you, Tisha. I just really appreciate your time, um, and I'm glad I got to connect with you. Um, kind of share with, real quick, how can people find you? Uh, share your, your Twitter handle, um, your blog, etc. How can people connect? Yes, so my... My Twitter handle is Tish Rich, so T I S H R I C H. I um, would love to connect on Twitter, the XP Lap book chat, where we discuss Explore Like a Pirate by Michael Matera, is on Wednesdays at 5 Pacific um, Central Time or Standard Time. And also, I do write a blog, which I'm gonna, I feel like I haven't been writing many blog posts lately. I need to catch up with myself, but it's the connected culinary classroom. So you can, you can follow my blog post there. Okay. Very cool. Well, Tisha, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your Sunday evening. Thank you very much. All Have right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for listening in on the Pittsburgh Gal Principal Podcast. I am always excited to connect with women in education, learn how they are balancing work and home, as well as challenging the status quo about what it means to be a successful woman. My podcast is all about elevating the voices of women, so please share these stories with your friends and your colleagues. Find me on Twitter at eclair_ahs. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.